All right, so we have a lot in store for the talk today. So let's start out by talking through the agenda. At the beginning of the talk, we're going to go through the council uh, use case pillars. So we're going to describe the real business value that council solves. And then we're going to go through a demystifying service mesh section. We're going to talk about how services, service meshes work in depth. And then Gordon's going to come on stage and talk about how Comcast uses council. After that, we're going to go through a demo app that's, that we've made, and it's running across four different runtimes and in two different AWS regions. Then, at the end of the talk, we are going to go through a demo of some of the service mesh benefits. And these benefits are security, observability, and traffic control. Awesome, so let's get started. All right, so now we have the use case. Ah, there we go. <laughs> I was one slide off. All right, so we have our use case pillars. And with our use case pillars, there's four of them. They are discover, secure, automate, and access. And so what does this mean? Let's dive into each of these in quite a bit of depth. So the first one that we have is discover. And so this includes council service discovery and health monitoring features. So let's talk about a scenario that some of you might have, and even if you don't have it now, maybe you'll have it in the future. And this is where you have services running in a bunch of different places. Maybe you have services running in a couple of different AWS regions, and some other services running on premises. And on top of that, you're running some services on Kubernetes, maybe some on Elastic Container Service, you have some Lambda functions, and even some virtual machines for good measure. This can be complicated to manage, and how do you know where these services live when they're on so many different environments? So when you're using Council, it acts as a centralized source of truth for services no matter where they're running, whether it's in different regions, in the cloud, on premises, or on different runtimes. And so this is super, super valuable. And then the last portion of this is health monitoring. So Council keeps track of the health of these services, no matter where they're running. So when you make a request to Council for a service, whether it's implicit via service mesh or explicit by making a request to one of our APIs or to our DNS interface, you can know that you're getting a healthy instance back wherever it's running because it really doesn't matter with Council. And so the flexibility that Council gives around working with services running in a number of different places, this is huge because it leaves the option open for all of you to evolve your architectures over time to meet whatever the demands are of tomorrow. All right, so the second use case pillar is secure. And this is a big one that you get by using the council service mesh. So what does this mean? There's three parts of it. There's secure connectivity, consistent security, and governance. All right, so let's start out by talking about uh, secure connectivity. So lots of organizations are moving towards requirements to have TLS connections between services. So that means that they're encrypted. And a new requirement that organizations have is mutual TLS or mutual authenticated services. And so how do you roll this out manually as a company? So you have to have a root certificate authority. And this key is top secret. If, you're, if you have AWS managing this or if you're using Vault, OK, there's already access controls around this. But if you have a self-signed certificate, how do you control access to this? This gets really complicated, and it's a really, really difficult problem that you would have to solve. So then now that you have this root certificate, you have to generate X509 certificates for every single service within your mesh. And you have to distribute them out and give them to the code editing teams. You have to help them roll these services out. And then you have to make sure that every single API that's going between services within your network is using them successfully. And this can be really, really hard. It's really easy to misconfigure something and bypass the validation here or there. And so this process is crazy. On top of that, you have to rotate certificates because certificates expire after a certain time period. And so this can be tons and tons of work for your engineers. All right, so then the last portion of this is governance. So governance, it, um, it includes a bunch of things, such as it'd be awesome to have a centralized place where all of your networking policies can live and be configured wherever services were running, whether it's on different runtimes or in different data centers. 
It'd also be really nice to have audit logs so you know that when things change, and to have fine-grained access control rules for everything that's going on. So, as you've guessed it, Council has solutions for all of these things, and we're gonna talk about how they work. So, the first portion of this is secure connectivity. When you're using the Council Service Mesh, it acts as the root certificate authority, and it can st securely store that root certificate. Then, Council automatically distributes certificates to all of all your, your applications and uses them. It makes sure that they're used. And then, when these certificates expire, or are getting close to expiring, it rotates these certificates too. So this is super powerful. I know you have a lot of questions based on this explanation, and we're gonna get into the way that this works into quite a bit of detail later on in the talk. All right, so the next portion of this is consistent security. And this includes, so you're running services in a bunch of different places. You're running, as we talked about before, they're in different data centers and on different runtimes. And given that you have a modern setup where you're using least privilege or you're going towards zero trust, you wanna set it up so that services have the least amount of access to other things that they actually can have. So when you're running a VM on premise and you're communicating with a Kubernetes service running in the cloud on EKS, how do you go about doing this? You can set up security groups in the cloud or you can set up, and you can set up IP tables rules um, on your virtual machines, and you have to make sure that they stay in sync over time. But what happens when one of your IP tables rules is set up and a new service is running on this? That means you have to reconfigure things altogether. So when you're using Council, we distribute these certificates, the X509 certificates that we've talked about, and baked into those certificates is the identity of the services themselves. And so we have a feature that's called intentions where you can specify rules based on the service's identity that say service A can communicate with service B, but nothing else. And so then when a request is made between the services, these rules are validated. And so these rules have nothing to do with IP addresses or things that, are, that change. They have to do with the service's identity. And this is super powerful. And this is another thing that you get for free by using Council Service Mesh. The last portion is governance. So Council acts as a centralized source of truth for everything. And one cool way that I like to use Council is Council has a Terraform provider and it has Kubernetes CRDs. You can put all of your configuration for Council and your networking layer as a whole into a version control system of your choice. You can then use CI and CD and deploy it based on that. And then you have a snapshot of the entire Council configuration in one place and you can go back and look at how things change over time. Council also has an extensive audit logging system. So you can look at why things change, or when things change, and start asking questions. Or if there's a security incident, you can see, oh, this is where the, the event happened, and so on. Council also has an ACL system. So you can provide users access to Council for a bounded amount of time, and you can, only, you can restrict their access to the things that they really need. All right, so the next use case pillar is automate, and this includes our network infrastructure automation tools. And so what does that mean? So in this case, let's say that you're spinning up a new service. And before you can actually use the new service, it needs to be registered into a load balancer, or you have to update a firewall rule. How would you traditionally go about doing this? So traditionally, you would spin up the service, create a support ticket, or a ticket for a different department, and then maybe an hour later if you're lucky, or a week, or a month if you're unlucky, it would finally get added to that load balancer. So this is a really, really long, and error-prone manual process. We've built a tool called Council Terraform Sync that really helps out with this use case. So when this new service is spun up, you just have to make sure it's registered within Council. And then automatically, Council will trigger Council Terraform Sync, which will run Terraform, just normal Terraform, like I'm sure many of you used before, that will update the load balancer for you. And all of this happens in a more secure way than the manual process. So first of all, Users don't even have to have their credentials in order to add the service to the load balancer. So it's one less attack vector. Also, the process is automated, which is less error prone. 
And so then on top of that, the last portion of this is Council is a centralized place for all of these things, so you can gain insights. There's audit logs when things change, there's logs, and so on. The last case, use case pillar, is access. And so this includes API gateways. So let's say that a request is going from a user outside of the network into the network. What does this mean? So this is a different use case. We've been talking a lot about requests between services in our network, but what happens when a request comes from the outside? Is that actually going to be a different workflow? So I like to think of it as we have an API gateway that works like just another service that's registered in the council. And so it makes northwest traffic, so requests coming into your network, the exact same as east-west requests. So you get trusted connections because API Gateway establishes mutual TLS connections with other services in your, in your network. You also get the same access control through Council's intention, so you can specify that the API Gateway can only communicate to specific, specific services, which is super helpful for identifying where your perimeter is when you're doing threat modeling and things like that. And then the final portion is simplified traffic management. Of, I, I hinted at it before, but API Gateway, Council's API Gateway, is the same as other services. So you can set up traffic control rules, which we'll get into quite a bit later, just like any other ser service. And this ends up being very powerful. All right, so this is it for our Council use case pillars. And now we're going to in, dive into the service mesh section. One thing of note is that I apologize for the slides. They don't look exactly like I expected. <laughs> the styles aren't fully applied, but I think we can make do. All right, so here's our service mesh introduction. So this is what things look like without a service mesh. So we have a, an app service that's making a request to the foo service. And in this case, we're using a DNS entry. And that DNS entry resolves to IP addresses where the foo service is running. And I'm sure most of you have seen this before. With a service mesh, things look slightly different. So in this case, there's a sidecar proxy that's running next to every service. So when app makes a request to foo, it first makes the request through its local sidecar proxy, then it goes to foo's sidecar proxy, and then finally to the foo service itself. Cool, this is awesome, but now we added an extra layer of things that we have to configure, but based on this slide, you can see Council is responsible for configuring these sidecar proxies. And on most runtimes, it automatically inserts them, so you, you don't really even have to care about them. But we'll get into that later on in the talk. So on this slide, you can see that there's dotted arrows that resemble Council updating the sidecar proxies. And we call these dotted arrows control plane traffic. And this represents Council controlling or reconfiguring all of these sidecar proxies. The solid lines are called data plane traffic, and these are the real requests that are going between services within your network. So now we're going to dig in and talk about what having a service mesh and using council service mesh allows us to do. So here we have an example where the app owning team for the Foo service, they're rolling out a new v2 version of their Foo service. The version one, it's been good, but it's operationally terrible. So they've rewritten the service, a v2 version, and they've decided to start rolling out traffic to it. They've decided to send half of the requests to the old version and half to the new version. When you're using Council, all you have to do is you have to reconfigure Council to do this using something that we call a service splitter. And automatically, the sidecar proxy for the app service is updated in order to send half of the traffic to the old version and half to the new version. This is really cool, but let's take a step back and look at what this would have looked like before without a service mesh. In this case, there's a couple of different ways that it would need to be done. But in any case, the code within the app service would need to be updated, whether it's by the Foo app owning team shipping a new client library and then updating that library within the app service, or you can just make the changes to do this using a feature flagging tool within the app service itself. This requires a lot of back and forths between multiple teams and coding. But with Council, you get around all of this, and it simplifies the lives of your developers. The next thing we're going to talk about is security. So we talked before at a high level about how Council sets up mutual TLS between services. 
But now we're gonna get into the actual how it works behind the scenes. So we talked about how council servers act as a root certificate authority, and they distribute certificates to services. That was a little bit of a lie. They actually distribute the certificates to the sidecar proxies of services. And then those sidecar proxies automatically use those services whenever requests are being made between different services. So from the perspective of app and foo, those services, they're making plain text connections between one another. But this is okay, because app and its sidecar communicate over the loopback interface. It's not going over the network, so you don't have to worry about sniffing. So app makes a request to its sidecar proxy. It thinks it's using plain text, but the sidecar proxy upgrades that request to use mutual TLS. Then, when the sidecar proxy for the foo service receives the request, it downgrades it to make a plain text connection over the loopback interface once again to the foo service. So now, without your developers needing to change the code at all, you have mutual TLS, you have encryption in transit, you're using all of the best practices. All right, so then the last benefit that we're going to get to for now is telemetry. So we have the app service communicating with the foo service just like before. The only difference is that in this case, we have Prometheus scraping metrics off of our sidecar proxies. With council service mesh, we use Envoy as the sidecar proxy. And Envoy collects hundreds of metrics. I haven't actually measured them, but that seems like a good estimate. It collects hundreds of metrics from each of these sidecar proxies, and every single service has the same metrics. And so then, as long as you're go you have all of your requests going through these sidecar proxies, you have metrics on everything that's going through your network. You don't have to worry about missing something, and you get in the middle of a sub one, and you find out, I don't actually have the data I need to know what's going on. You don't have to update your code with hundreds of lines of code and annotations in the code to ensure that you have these. You actually get them all for free just by using the service mesh. All right, so this is it for the initial introduction to service mesh. So we've learned that with a service mesh, every app has a local sidecar proxy. We've also learned that these proxies control all networking traffic and council is responsible for configuring them. And then we talked at a, at a high level about how the service mesh helps out with security, observability, reliability, and traffic control. So this is a simple case where you're running a simple service mesh setup. But what happens when you're running services across multiple data centers and you don't have a flat networking setup? So let's, in this example, we have the app and the foo service, just like before, but they're running on two completely separate networks. And to make things even more complicated, they're running on the same IP address. So how do you go about doing this? There's a different gateway type that council configures called a mesh gateway. And mesh gateways only responsibility is sending requests from one data center to another using mutual TLS. So this can happen over the public internet. So in this case, app is in US West 1, foo is in US West 2. When app makes a request, its sidecar proxy says, oh, I know the service is living somewhere else. I'm gonna send it through the mesh gateway to the other data center. The remote mesh gateway then sends it to the sidecar proxy for the foo service, and so on. So this, also, the same flow works for our control plane traffic. So if we have a new instance of the app service that becomes healthy, it's synced over an MTLS connection, so it can be done over the public internet also, between our data centers. So just taking one step back, what if you have a flat network because you're using Direct Connect or a VPN or something like this? You can forget this section for now. But it's still important to keep this at the back of your minds, because what if your networking topology becomes more complicated over time? It'd be really nice to have a tool, such as Council, that will evolve with you and you won't have to work around. All right, so we've gone through the Federation section. So here we've learned that mesh gateways enable encrypted cross data center routing. And we've also shown that they're used for both control and data plane traffic. So now we've done the multi-data center use case, and now we're gonna go into the multiple runtimes. So we're gonna talk about Kubernetes, Lambda, EC2 to demonstrate virtual machines, and Elastic Container Service. So let's get started by, talk by showing how the architecture looks on all of these runtimes. 
On this slide, Lambda is missing because it's a little bit of a special workflow because there's different constraints. But as you can see here, on Kubernetes, ECS, and EC2, everything looks pretty much the same. Within a Kubernetes pod, you have your service and the sidecar proxy. And the only thing that needs to happen is it needs to be registered into the council control plane. On ECS, it's the same thing, but rather than calling it a, ta a pod, it's called a task. On a virtual machine, you have to run the app and its sidecar proxy next to each other, and you might do this with system D or something like that. So then the last remaining runtime that we have is Lambda. With Lambda, there's a very different constraints. For example, Lambda doesn't support mutual TLS. It also has a very different billing mechanism where you're billed based on the number of milliseconds that the Lambda runs and on CPU utilization and on memory utilization. There's also a third problem that there's a concept of cold starts, so the amount of time that your app or takes to, to start up, it can really, really impact the user experience. So if your app takes seconds to start up, then your users wait for that many seconds to get a response. So these are all constraints that we had to work around when, when designing our Lambda integration. So we built two different use cases in order to minimize the trade-offs that we had to make. The first use case is calling from a mesh service out to a Lambda function, and then the second is calling from that Lambda function into the mesh. And so we're gonna talk about both of those separately. So in this case, we have the same app and foo service that we've had all along. The only difference is that the foo service has to be tagged as a Lambda within council. Once that happens, app sidecar proxy is automatically updated to rather than invoke the service based on an IP address or something like that, it makes a request to the Lambda appropriately. Then the last thing that needs to happen is that all requests to the Lambda APIs need to be signed, so you have to have the appropriate IAM credentials available. All right, so then the other workflow is calling from a Lambda function into, into the mesh. So we built something that makes this really easy called the Council Lambda extension. And its responsibility is to start up really, really lightweight sidecar proxies. And their only responsibility is to upgrade connections that are made to it from the code within the Lambda function itself to use mutual TLS. So the Envoy extensions uh, proxy receives a request. It then sends that request to a mesh gateway because mesh gateways know where all services are running. And then finally, it makes it onto the destination service. And all of this happens with a very, very minimal impact on the runtime, cold start latency, and, and resource utilization because we built a custom uh, Lambda extension just for this use case. All right, so that's it for our multi-runtime introduction. Now Gordon's gonna talk about Comcast's use cases. Thank you, Eric. That uh, really sets up the context uh, for the uh, next slides. So uh, Comcast has many products. Some of them are shown on this slide here. The ones we're gonna double click on today are the white boxes on the left. For a lot of folks, that Wi-Fi access point and those repeaters are the internet. And as technologists, sometimes we forget how our products are perceived when all we see are microservices, network segments, and REST calls. So just to give you an idea of uh, the scale that we deal with every day, um, we have over 60 million homes and businesses that use our services, and we have over 1.3 trillion DNS lookups a day. Just to give you an idea, that's 15 million DNS queries per second, all traveling over our network. But the area we're going to focus on today is the enterprise network. That's the second bullet here. So we have over 10,000 unique CIDR blocks. That's not subscribers. That's not homes. That's just our back-end services exist in over 10,000 unique CIDR blocks. Each network must have you know, hardware and cloud firewall rules. So I guess you're doing the math and figuring out it's a lot. Um, and then we've got to carefully manage IPv4 address space, even though we have IPv6 in the network, still a lot of services that run our IPv4. So from an AWS standpoint, we have more than 1,000 accounts, most of them in the USA. Uh, we have a lot of on-prem data centers, uh, all connected with AWS Direct Connect. And we'll touch a little bit more on that in a minute. Uh, we also have multiple workload environments, um, as you've presented. Um, so a great match there. So what problems are we trying to solve? 
um, we need responsive multi-regional failover. We need ubiquitous observability, and we've seen uh, Eric's presentation how that works. And we need to reduce network complexity, and that's critical for us. It takes time to set all this stuff up when you're deploying new services. So if we can make a uh, subnet agnostic uh, uh, environment where people can deploy the same workload in multiple VPCs, uh, multiple subnets, and just have traffic go to it automatically, that's a win for us. Obviously, less hardware um, and cloud firewall rules. And then, of course, we drop a whole bunch of stuff. So low balancers, we have to do mutual TLS certificate rotation, and no more chains of reverse proxies just to get from A to B, which, of course, improves latency. Um, so here we have uh, a network architecture for um, AWS. So I know it's kind of tiny, but I'll start at the top. So we've got three boxes there. Each one represents three regions. And within there, we have multiple VPCs. Now, we don't show the accounts, but you can imagine thousands of VPCs, you know, thousands of accounts. Now, the cool thing is that we link those with uh, Transit Gateway. That's the little uh, box just below. And what that does is it allows VPCs to talk to each other in the same region without having to go into our network and back out of our network. So it keeps latency very, very low. And it's an excellent way to have multiple accounts, uh, good isolation, multiple VPCs, but not pay any high latency costs because Transit Gateway takes care of that. Below that, we've got the um, uh, Direct Connect infrastructure that goes to Colo facilities uh, just there. And then uh, each of those are in turn connected to our data centers. You'll notice the arrows are crossing over between the um, on-prem data centers. That's to give us failover capability from those Direct Connect uh, gateways. So very resilient, and, and this is how we're deployed today in the US. So let's look at a failover scenario here. So we've got normal running conditions. We've got service A talking to service B, and we'll see the red arrow going from A to B on the bottom right. Great, fantastic. We have a failover condition, we have a failure. So service B stops running in uh, the region on the right. Now, typically, if you have just some ALBs or whatever, that's it, you're done. Service A can't talk to anything. So you've got to do so, quite a few gymnastics if you want to do a layer four solution for this. Well, Console Connect understands multiple data centers. So what it says is, hey, look, service B is not there. And I'm going to send traffic to the, the middle region there and go to a service B instance that's working. And this happens automatically. Your application code doesn't know about this. It's all hidden under the hood. Because the abstraction layer you get from console and Envoy enables this capability. So what does it look like? How do you configure it? So if you deployed everything in the service mesh, got it all configured, everything's working, and uh, you do nothing, then yes, traffic won't go to the other region. So you have to put this stanza into the service mesh. And you should load this via an API. And what you say is, hey, look, service name, has a connect time out of 15 seconds, which is great. So it, your service doesn't actually have to crash or completely be gone. It could be running slow. And gray failures are a real problem. So this can detect a gray failure. And then it triggers the next block, the failover block. Now, this is a, a simplified version. You can do some complexity here. But basically, it says, hey, look, if you can't reach any services in this region, or there's a delay of 15 seconds, then we're going to fail you over to one of the other regions. And it'll pick the nearest one and it'll send that traffic over to that service. And when things return to normal, it'll send it back to the local service instead. And that's it. And you can change this in production live. So we could change the regions, reduce the number of regions, increase them, no application code changes, no redeployment, nothing. Very, very uh, useful feature. So here's a live view of uh, some of our uh, console intentions. So we've got a service in the middle. Uh, and of course, I had to blur out some of the names here. Uh, but uh, talking to services on the right, there's two arrows, fantastic. And you'll notice on the left, there's a box with an arrow with a red X in it. And that's saying traffic is not allowed to flow from that service to that service. As a service owner, all you have to do is go in there and click the X. And now you've allowed traffic or deny traffic. That's it. No firewall rule changes, no tickets, no delay you can go and do everything from the UI here. And it's per service rather than per CIDR block, which is fantastic. So benefits of console intentions. So you don't need as many layer four rules. Instead of having tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of layer four rules between different services, you can just say, hey, I want 10.8 in, 10.8 out for Envoy only, and you're done. So that really simplifies the pressure on your security group rules uh, in AWS, uh, as we said on my next bullet point. 
Um, you allow real-time self-service, allow and deny for service owners. And this is pretty cool. You can actually define the intentions based on HTTP headers. So you can say, hey, this request is allowed through if this header is present and deny ones where it's absent, which is really, really fine-grained. And if you think about this, a lot of services today have security group rules that say outbound internet 443 unrestricted for a service, so it can reach wherever it needs to go. Well, that enables things like a log4j bug. If everything's in a service mesh, services are not allowed to talk to the internet without going through the service mesh. Log4j would basically be stopped dead in its tracks. It wouldn't be able to download the class file that would allow it to work. So that's another benefit here. And of course, our cybersecurity team loves these benefits. OK, so what did we learn uh, as we've deployed the service mesh at Comcast? First of all, it's a journey. It's change, right? Developers uh, have a lot of work on their plate. They don't always have bandwidth for a change where they don't obviously see the value, which brings us on to our next point. You've, you've got to understand the value proposition first and tailor it for the individual team that's going to be integrating it. Some teams have different needs, and it's important to understand that. And of course, it takes time. You know, if you've got something like Kubernetes, it's fairly easy to do a horizontal deployment. But if you've got folks that are spread out, very microservice focused, um, um, uh, very enabled to, to, to work quickly, you know, uh, they're going to have different needs. Some might be using Terraform, some might be using CloudFormation, et cetera. And the last thing is HashiCorp has been a first class partner. They've been willing to listen to uh, our needs and shape their product roadmap, and obviously the needs of other customers. Thank you. All right, awesome. So the next thing that we're going to go through is the demo application that's running across four different runtimes and two different AWS regions. And so this demo application is called HashiCups. At HashiCorp, we love coffee. And so we've made a silly little demo application that allows you to buy, or at least pretend to buy, HashiCorp product-related drinks. So some examples are the Terraspresso for our Terraform pro uh, product, or our Volate for Vault. But my favorite is definitely the Connectachino for Council. So then once you choose your coffee, which don't we all need coffee? It's been a while since lunch, and we've had our last one. So I've added my Connectachino to the cart. You add it to your cart. You can pay and check out. But for the sake of our demo, it's way over-engineered. It's running five different services. You'd never want to do this in real life, but we're doing it so that we can demonstrate what it looks like to use Council in two different regions and on four different runtimes. So we have these five services. We have a front-end service that has the UI. We have a, a public API, and that makes requests to our products API and our payment service. And for good measure, we also have a Postgres database. So how do we run these services on the cloud? So within US West 1, we have our Kubernetes cluster. And at the end of the talk, I promise I won't forget, we're going to use Lambda functions. In US West 2, we have an ECS cluster. And we're running some virtual machines, too. So now let's put these services onto the architecture. On Kubernetes, we have our front end, public API, and payment service. In US West 2, on ECS, we have our products API and our Postgres instance running on EC2. So before we show the demo app, I'm going to explain to you all how deploying onto Council Service Mesh works. So let's get started by talking about Kubernetes. So if you're a Kubernetes user, you've all seen deployments before. The only thing that needs to happen is that that deployment needs to be annotated saying connect inject true. And then when this happens, the sidecar proxy will automatically be injected by Council Kubernetes. The service will automatically be registered within the Council control plane. And all the updates will automatically start happening. happening. On a virtual machine, you, there isn't quite as much automation because it's a virtual machine that you all operate. And there, it's harder to intercept things. So you have to have a service definition. You specify the name of the service, the port it's running on, and then you have a little stanza at the bottom that says, this is a connect service that has a sidecar proxy. So then after the service is registered into council, you have to run the service itself and the sidecar proxy. So in this case, it's using systemd, but you can use whatever you would like to run these processes. 
Then the last runtime that we have is ECS. So in ECS, you configure what runs within a task based on a task definition. And in this case, we're, using, we're demonstrating with Terraform what it looks like to configure a task definition. So when you set up a task definition, you give it a name, you specify whether it's running on Fargate or EC2, and then you also specify which containers are going to run. You can manually set this up to uh, work with Council, and I think actually Comcast has been doing this for a while, or did this in the past at least. But we built something to make this user experience much better. Uh, and Sorry, I'm trying to go back. I think I might be missing a slide, but that's okay. So we built a special Terraform module called Council ECS that makes this entire process um, easy. So you pass in basically the same information into our Terraform module. It automatically inserts the sidecar proxy uh, container and ensures that the service is registered within Council and does all of the same things that we've talked about. So now I'm going to start to show you all how this, how this is working in my demo setup. So let's hope that it goes smoothly. All right. So in the US West One data center, as promised, here's the Kubernetes cluster. In US West Two, we have our ECS cluster that you can see is running some services. We also have the council server for the US West Two data center running on an EC2 instance. And we have our Postgres database that's also running on an EC2 instance. So then let's just pull up our application and ensure that everything is working. So I'm gonna add my connected Chino to the cart and then I'm gonna go to checkout, but first I have to create an account. I'll choose a random username and sign in. So now I have my account and we have to fill out our payment details for our virtual coffee. But like any good virtual coffee shop, we have an autofill payments button. I don't recommend it for real apps. So then I'm gonna click on the pay now button and you can see that the order went through. There's one thing that I'd like you to notice. So at the bottom of the screen, you can see that it says encryption disabled. And this means that within the payment service, it's actually not using any sorts of best practices. It's storing all of the payment details in plain text. So the team, that owns that service has been working on this and they rolled out a new service and they're rolling out a new service called Lambda Payments that uses Vault as a backend and we're gonna use that as a demo at the end of our talk. So this is the architecture that we have and we've shown that everything can work. The last thing that I'd like to show you at this point is that this is what the council user interface looks like. You can see that we have a bunch of services registered into the US West One data center and we have the other services registered into the US West 2 data center. All of these services show up in the same place, no matter where they're running. So then there's this peers tab, which is the way we uh, connect our data centers. And you can see that the US West 1 data center is connected to the US West 2 data center. And that we're getting a couple of services from that data center that we're going to use towards the end of the talk. All right, so this is it for our multi-runtime introduction. So we've shown that Council can run services on Kubernetes, virtual machines, and Elastic Container Service. And we've promised that at the end of the talk, we're gonna show how it works with Lambda. We've also shown that you can connect these Council clusters that are running on completely different networks with our mesh gateways. At HashiConf EU, one of my colleagues, Luke Kaisau, and I gave an in-depth version of this talk where we actually deploy HashiCups from scratch across four different uh, data centers and five different runtimes, if I remember right. So I guess there's no QR code. I don't know where it went, but I can share a link. If anyone wants to come up to us in the hallway afterwards, we can definitely give you a link, or maybe you can get a picture and copy the text from that. But I apologize about that. All right, so now we're gonna go through the benefits and we're gonna actually demonstrate how they work um, on top of our sample application. The first thing that we're going to talk about is security and we're gonna dive into the way that intentions work. So 
we have the same services that we had before. We're distributing the certificates, and we're automatically using them. That's easy. We talked about that 20 minutes ago. Encoding, oh, encoded in these certificates is the identity of these services. And so on top of this, we're able to configure council intentions. So the way it works is that you create an allow rule or a deny rule. Let's say the deny rule for the sake of example. You create a deny intention between these services, and then the sidecar proxy for the foo service is updated to deny requests that are coming from the app service. And so I'm gonna show you quick how that works. So we have the council user interface pulled up here, and I'm gonna click on the intentions tab. So we have set all of the access between services set up using least privilege, so we have a default deny intention, and we're only allowing the specific services to communicate between one another that actually need to. So for the sake of making it really easy to visualize, I'm gonna deny all of requests to our front end service, which is the user interface. So when this happens, the sidecar proxies are updated in the way I talked about with these rules. And so when I go back to HashiCups, you can see the, the front end isn't working at all. So now, if I go back to the interface, sorry, and I create an allow rule again, then the sidecar proxies will be updated to now start allowing requests between these services. And it's taking a second. All right, and there you go. Now everything's working just how it did before. So this is really cool within a single data center, but the same exact mechanism works across multiple, uh, between mesh gateways, so across different networks. So even when service requests are made for between the app service and Foo and they're running in different data centers, you still have your council intentions and they can be used uh, for your security. The next thing we're gonna talk about is observability. And you can see here, we have the diagram that we saw before, but now I'm gonna show a demo of it. So we have Prometheus scraping our metrics, and I'm already running a Grafana user interface for us to look at. So if we go back to our, all right, so here I'm running Grafana. So this dashboard is set up for HTTP services, so I'm gonna trace through some of the services, showing that they have the exact same metrics and labels. So I'm gonna click on the front end service, and you can see here, we have the request counts, error rates, and latency for this service. Using the same metrics names and labels, we also have the public API, and that's, running, that's also running in Kubernetes, so that's easy peasy. But a more complicated example is the products API. That's running on ECS, in a completely different region. And so this is really cool. We have all of our metrics from different data centers and different runtimes getting to the exact same place. So then the last part is, wait, how does this actually get wired up? So with the way I set this demo up, we have the main Prometheus instance running in US West 1. And it's pulling metrics through mesh gateways, just like what any other service would do, from a Prometheus instance in US West 2, so all of the metrics end up in the same place. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is traffic control. And so at the beginning of the talk, we talked about service splitters a little bit. Gordon also talked about failover. And I'm gonna talk about failover some more. These are relatively simple use cases, but Council supports way more complicated uh, traffic control use cases than what we're going to get into today. So for this example, I'm setting it up so that we fail over requests to the payment service to our new Lambda payment service. The development team has finally gained enough confidence to start sending requests to the Lambda payment service, and they've decided that they wanna do it if the normal payment service isn't working because it's operationally terrible and they'll get enough requests to start learning some things. So this is the way it works. When the payment service is healthy, all the requests go to the payment service. When it's unhealthy, none of the requests go to the main payment service because they're sent to the Lambda payment service. So one last thing before I jump in and show you how that works is wait, I didn't tell you all how Lambda works. So let's talk about how Lambda integration works with Council. So we built a service called Council Lambda Registrator and as you may have guessed, it runs as a Lambda function and it's triggered based on event bridge rules. And these event bridge rules 
happen whenever Lambda functions are modified. So they're created, deleted, tagged, untagged, and so on. So then, whenever Lambda Registrator receives these events, it gets the associated tags for that Lambda function, and if the function, the Lambda function, is supposed to be registered into council, it registers it there. And it makes sure that these registrations stay up to date. So then, the next question is, what does that tag look like? And so, you deploy your Lambda function however you would like to. It just needs a tag that looks like the one on this slide that says that Lambda integration is enabled. So then, if you disable that tag, then it won't be registered in council anymore. If you change other options that are out of the scope of this talk, then it also won't be, it won't be in council anymore or its configuration will be changed. All right, so now I'm gonna show you an actual failover example. So before this talk started, I set up a port forward on the public API service to a port that is um, forwarding to the payment service so that we can simulate a failover using my text editor. And I'm gonna make my font bigger. So already, is that big enough? All right, awesome. So now I have the payment service running, and this is what a sample request looks like between the services. So now the payment service is healthy, so you can see that encryption is disabled, meaning there's no failover scenario. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna scale down the payment service to zero. Uh, typing is important. All right, that should do it. All right, so we've scaled down the payment service, which will trigger the failover to happen. We can wait for the pod to no longer be healthy, and it looks like that's already happening. So now, if I make the same API request before, we can see that the failover happened the team decided to update this field to encryption enabled by default. We can see that the actual failover happened. So now, for the demo, we can say, ah, it's been a long 10 minutes since we bought our last coffee. I need another connect to Chino. So I'm gonna add it to my cart, and then we're gonna try to observe the failover. So now I made the payment, and you can see, from the user's perspective, it was seamless. The failover happened, and very few requests would have failed in the meantime. Nobody has to get paged in the middle of the night, and there's no code changes required. All right, so in this section, we went through security, observability, and traffic control, and we showed how council can help with all of these. We also showed council being connected and different networks being connected via our mesh, and mesh gateways and that council makes making requests between different runtimes and different networks seamless. And we also showed that in the case of Lambda, especially, because it's very different to use than other services, council does a really good job of abstracting away the differences between different runtimes. So we've reached the end of the talk, so let's go through quick what we've talked about today. We went through the council use case pillars. We've talked about all of the business value that it can provide, and it, so then after that, we gave a quick introduction to Service Mesh. We described the way that it works within a single network and a single runtime, and then we expanded it to multiple networks and multiple runtimes. After that, Gordon talked about Comcast's use cases for Council, and then we showed the demo app, the HashiCups app that's running across four different runtimes in two different AWS regions. Then finally, at the end of our presentation, we went through the service mesh benefits, and those are security, observability, and traffic control. If you're interested in learning more, you can check out our website at council.io. We have documentation and guides that explain how to use council there, and council is also open source, and so you can check out our GitHub repo and try it out. It's at github.com forward slash hashicorp forward slash council. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> and thank you. Yep. <laughs>